Wow, hello, dear friends. Uh, I, I don't know how to tell you that if I look excited, it's only because I really am excited. I'm so excited. Uh, lately, we've been really receiving so many response, comments, questions, prayer requests from all over the world. Just in the last week, we received 200 prayer requests from Indonesia, Malaysia, Sweden, Switzerland, Holland, France. All over the United States, uh, Texas, North Carolina, Oregon, Oklahoma, California, uh, all over Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, El Salvador, etc., etc. It's really, it's, it's it's very exciting. And every single time I actually start broadcasting a lesson from Jerusalem, it, it, it gets me really excited. But this time, we're doing uh, something even greater because. We're beginning a journey. When we began uh, the Shalom Jerusalem Foundation just a few months ago, I said we want to turn the Temple Mount into what it's supposed to be, a world center for peace. But we, we're, we're aiming much higher. We want to redeem the Temple Mount. We want to fulfill the prophecies that the Temple Mount will be a world center for prayer. The house will be a house of prayer for all nations. We want the Temple Mount to be an origin of Torah. From Zion will come out Torah and the Word of God from Jerusalem. And we want the Temple Mount to really be a, a world center of shalom, of true peace, diversity. So today I'm so excited because we're beginning the journey where every single week I hope to upload a lesson from the book of Genesis, the Torah, we're going to go through the Torah. Uh, from the prophets, we're going to begin at Joshua. And from uh, the book of Psalms, which is so close to my heart. And it's all from the inspiration we receive from the divine presence of God on Temple Mount. So please, if you see and feel you want to share it with others, feel free to do so. If you want to share with me your questions, comments, uh, thoughts of any kind, please please do so. And uh, uh, your existence is what really gives me, gives us in Shalom Jerusalem Foundation the uh, uh, ability to continue. So uh, once again, Yehuda Glick, very excited from uh, Jerusalem, from shalomjerusalem.org, Shalom Jerusalem Foundation. Uh, beginning the book of Genesis. Uh, this week, in the synagogues around the world, we'll be reading the, the portion of Genesis from uh, chapter 1 all the way to uh, chapter 6, verse 8. But mainly, I would say the first eight verses of uh, chapter 6 are more a, an, a, an introduction to uh, next week's story of the flood of Noah. Uh, this week, we, I would like to uh, share with you thoughts on the uh, five first chapters of Bereshit, Genesis. It's a lot. There are a whole bunch of stories. Each one of them raises philosophical questions, theological questions, and they're based, to, we're actually starting the Torah, starting the Bible. It's the whole wave, the whole base of the Bible is the foundation stone, the infrastructure of the entire Bible is right over here. And we can't cover every single point uh, way far from that in this uh, teaching. But we, I do hope to really try to find a theme that goes through the whole portion and really as an infrastructure for what the Torah is trying to teach us, what God is trying to teach us. So, my dear friends, let's dive into it. Oh, thank God for the privilege of, of being able to study his word here in Jerusalem, after the people of Israel have returned to Jerusalem, to land, to their homeland, and inspired by going and visiting and talking and teaching on the Temple Mount. Temple Torah, Temple Mount Torah, beginning right now from the book of Genesis. Reshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz והארץ הייתה תוהו ובוהו, וחושך על תהום, ורוח אלוהים מרחפת 
Al Pinei Haman. Yes, I'm not going to be teaching in Chinese this time. We're going to be going, and all our lessons will be in English until maybe if I learn a different language. So I'll just read the first two sentences I read. The first two verses, very famous verses uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, I'll read according to the translation, simple translation, the Rishit in the beginning. Bara Elohim et et God created the heaven and the earth. This very first verse of the book coming to teach us a basic idea that there's no separation between heaven and earth. In the, in the source, in the roots, heaven, spirituality, and earth, materialism, all come from one God. They're all connected. Later we'll see the separation which takes place in the seven days of creation. But uh, we can definitely say that uh, the very message begins. It's all one, one God. Not what the idol worshippers are, are trying to tell us, that every single thing or every single power or every single energy in the world has a different origin. Here the Torah begins from the beginning, saying, from the beginning, heaven and earth created by one God. Right away, in verse 2, and the earth was tohu vavo. Tohu vavo are two words which pretty much, we don't know exactly what they mean. But when we read their parallels in the, in the book, we find that the tohu vavo are some kind of expression of, of wilderness, of emptiness. But emptiness in a form of, of, of a mess, uh, not, not organized. The earth was without form and void, and the whole thing was covered with darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, Merachefet al is flying, is moving upon the waters. So, what do we have? The world is one big thing. Of earth, which is wilderness, emptiness, and a mess, darkness, and the Spirit of God is covering the waters, which are also all over the world. Later on, we'll see them. Day two, we'll have the separation between the upper water and the lower water. On day three, we'll have the separation between the uh, dry land and the seas and then the plants, etc., etc. But what do we have from the beginning? From the beginning, it's a whole bigness. Why is it so important for the Bible to tell us this? Why can't the Bible just start right away? At the beginning, God created, and God said there shall be light, as it says in verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Or, or is light. Let there be light, let there be or, and there was light. Why did the Torah have to start from describing the wilderness, the darkness, the big mess, the total andromosia? I believe that this is one of the most important themes that the Torah is trying to teach us. The creation begins with light. God said there should be light, and there was light. And God looked at the light, and he saw it was so great. He separated the uh, the light from the darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness night. But most important, he looked at the light and saw it was good. After he divided between the light and the darkness. And then every single day, pretty much at the end of every creation, he says, he looks at it and says it's good until he looks at the whole thing, the entire thing. Uh, and he says, the whole thing is not only good, it is very good. After the creation of the man, the man itself doesn't say that it was good, but he takes a look and he says everything. Uh, talking about verse 31 in chapter 1, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So everything he's making is good, but the Torah wanted to start from describing the fact that it wasn't always good. There were, there was, there were, there were things that were mixed up between each other. And it doesn't always start from good. And when you see things are not as they should be, it doesn't mean you should give up. You should actually say there shall be light. 
Yes, this is what we're told to do. We're told to go in the, in, the, in the footsteps of God. We are told to go in the footsteps of God to also say to the world, yes, it looks like darkness, but it can be light. It's a matter of how we look at it and what we want and what we desire in the world. Yes, things that are not perfect can become better. And the Torah from the very beginning of creation wanted us to know, already in verse 2, it wasn't so great. There was wilderness. There was emptiness. And from that, the Spirit of God fills the world with light, looks at the light and says it's good. And every one of the creations, he said, God looks at and he says it's good, except for one, mankind. God didn't say whether it was good. And that's very quite obvious because in chapter 2 already we see, chapter 3, we already see that there's a problematic issue with, the, with mankind. But what the story of creation is teaching us is that things that are bad can be improved. And the final three words of the story of creation are in, actually they're in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 3, after the Sabbath was also created, and God rested. And God said, he concluded the activity that he had done. Asher bara Elohim la'asot. He created to be done. Man has an, a, a, an obligation to improve this creation. That's what mankind is supposed to do. Look at the things that, are, that, that need to be, to be fixed and fix them. Following chapter 1, we have chapters 2 and 3 which discuss the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God obligates them to eat from all the trees of the garden. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and bad. But they look at it and they see the only thing they're obligated not to do, and they do, and they eat. Because the tree is with an ability fulfilling all the man's desires, maybe even to become like God, but the desire of creation, of, of, of uh, developing things, and he eats from the tree. And we would think it's all over. Because God said, if, when you eat from the tree, death will be coming to the world. But no. God punishes man. He sends him away from the Garden of Eden. He even puts the Kruvim to protect the tree of life so that man should not touch it. But then there's a question. Why did he put the Kruvim to protect the tree of life? Why did he could just uproot the tree of life? He's coming to hint something. Eventually we are to return to the Garden of Eden. Again, the theme that begins that what's bad can be repaired. And we have to try to repair. We have to try to repent. And we have to try to return to the ideal place, to the Garden of Eden, to the ideal situation, intimacy with God, to the ideal world filled with light. And that is what man is supposed to learn from these stories. You are obligated to try to return, to repent, to come back to God. The next story, the story of the two brothers, Cain and Abel. Here we see two, two sons, each one choosing a profession. One goes into the field of developing the land, growing crops, the other one, using the animals, being a shepherd. But the beauty of this is totally hurt, destroyed because of jealousy, because of misunderstanding, unaccepting the other. And once again, we would think maybe it's all over. But first of all, some good things came out of Cain. 
his descendants were the developers of many of the new technologies of mankind. But the most important, when Cain said to God, my punishment is too, is too harsh, please find me a way to, to, to survive. God doesn't cancel the punishment, but he says, yes, we can fix things. We can repair things and we can repent. And yes, the, the, the sin of, of murder is nothing worse than that. It's, even, it, it's, it's, it's compared to the, the sin of Adam and Eve, which, which God, where they went against God. But even here, the message is, you're sent away, but you can try to return. You are obligated to try to return. You're obligated to repent. In chapter 5, we go back to the continuation of mankind. Where after the two sins, the two great sins, the sin of Garden and the Garden of Eden, the sin of Cain and Abel, the religious sin, I would say, and the moral sin, and they're both tragic sins, traumatic sins, terrible sins. But the message from the beginning of creation, our job is to repent. Our job is to try to repair, not to reach a situation of anxiety, of anxiety, of uh, giving up, of feeling that things are over. We're always trying to once again return to God. And where is the God's divine presence that we can return to? Where is the Garden of Eden? We know from the book of Joel 4.18. We know from the book of Zechariah 14.8. We know from Ezekiel, the description. We know from the Kruvim that are waiting, the Garden of Eden in this world, the place where God's presence is, is in Jerusalem, is in the Temple Mount. As Zechariah says in, verse, in chapter 1, return to me and I will return to you. From the very beginning of the Torah, we know that we have to strive to return to God. Because we have to strive to receive His Word, and we have to strive to express ourselves and talk to Him and be connected to Him. And this is the story of Genesis, the foundation of the Bible. Beginning in verse 1, that it's all one. Heaven and earth are all one. And the place where heaven and earth meets is on the Temple Mount. And even when everything is in a big mess, on the Temple Mount will come life, even to the Dead Sea, even to the places of darkness will come light. The great light that God created on day one. The light without borders. We will be able to return to live in the presence of God, in the Garden of Eden. To be able to hear the voice of God. To be able to live closely with God. And the entire portion of Bereshit, Genesis, is teaching us again and again. Man is not perfect. Man is the only creation that has an ability to choose freedom of choice. And that also gives him the ability to go back and look where he came from. And once again and again to choose his path to God and to strive to live in the presence of God. That God who created by saying there shall be light. Created light, looked at the light and said it was good. Looked at everything he created and said it was very good. And told man that his mission is to bring all this back to the connection to God, to the Temple Mount, to the place where it all began, the origin of the Word of God, of the light of God, to peace, to peacefulness of the world. Shalom, my dear friends from Jerusalem, waiting to hear your comments, questions, thoughts. Please, if you liked it, also share it with others. Shalom from Jerusalem, shalomjerusalem.org.